Hello, everyone. My name is Ian Rowe. And I'm Nike Fajors. And welcome to The Invisible Men, where we make the achievements of incredible men invisible no more. Hello, my name is Ian Rowe, and I am a resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. Hello, I'm Nike Fajors. I'm part of the Leadership Network at AEI. And welcome to the latest episode of The Invisible Men, where we work very hard to identify uh, men who you may not uh, have ever heard of, but who are demonstrable examples of Black excellence. And we love the opportunity to bring some amazing folks on who can demystify some of the steps that they've practiced in their own lives, the barriers that they've faced, and share that with all of us on how we can inspire people of all races to achieve excellence in their own lives. And today we're very pleased to have someone, Cliff Barber, who Cliff was part of the original team of the Invisible Men with Mike, you and I. Cliff, it's great to see you, man. Good to see you, Ian. Good to be here with you and Nike. Yeah, when we- Great reunion. Yeah, great. (laughs) We have to look at the old Invisible Men video. We all look like like 12 years old. (laughs) Um, but yeah so cliff you were with us right we were invisible then now we're just old men (laughs) yeah now we're just old (laughs) crazy 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 um but cliff you are now the uh the chief strategies uh, the chief strategy officer um at the archdiocese in chicago but you are truly and truly uh renaissance man you're doing ministry work within the prison system A big chunk of your career has also been about generating economic wealth within the black community. So you've really, I mean, so we're proud of all the things that you've done uh, since business school. I know you were in London for a little while, which we'll hear about, but so good. And you're a father of five. Oh my gosh. And a husband (laughs) and so just so many great things. So thank you for joining us on this episode of Invisible. Thank you for having me. Yeah, and so why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself, any um, turning points early in your life that that would be of interest um, to our audience, and then we'll get into it. You know, it's so interesting, Ian, you asked that question, because I think we all of us, sometimes we look back and go, well, how did, I, how did God choose to put me in the family he put me in or in the neighborhood he put me in? And, you know, I am thankful to my parents. I'm thankful to God uh, for uh, the many benefits that I had in the beginning of my life. But my life in some ways started out quite simple on the south side of Chicago uh, in, uh, you know, Chicago, quite a segregated city. And so everything I saw was kind of, I would say, very parochial in the little neighborhood that I lived in, the little Catholic school I went to when I grew up. And so when I marched along, I just kind of did well in school. My parents taught me to do well in school. And I think I, I had a, it was a very insular world to me uh, until I got to uh, eighth grade and, and I was picked for some reason to go to uh, I did a science project and I had to take the science project downstate to the downstate science fair. And I remember at the downstate science fair, suddenly I saw all these kids I hadn't seen them before who were really smart. <laughs> you know, they were high achievers. And I was like, well, wait a minute, I want to be one of them. Uh, I, I, there's nothing wrong with the people I had back at my at my neighborhood in South Side of Chicago, but I was like, I want to be with that group. And I think something there turned into, you know, I can keep being better. And this whole idea of self-improvement and shooting for bigger things, it's there was a seed right there. And I, it sounds simple and whatever, but I can trace back. That was when I was like, okay, well, I want to go to the very best high school. Well, then I want to go to the very best this. And it started this movement of always wanting the best for myself and trying to to get to take whatever I've been given and just push it right to the limit and get the best out of it I could. Got it. And did you have brothers and sisters when you were growing up? I had three younger brothers. Um, and so in some ways you do as the older person in a family, any of you who are older, you do feel this responsibility to be the the trendsetter or the, the, the uh, path uh, trailblazer or whatever. So I did feel that a little bit, but it really was more of just a realization. And I, I don't know where this comes from. I think people always ask, well, where does drive come from? But certainly there was a cer- early on, right around this time was this kind of inner drive, not to satisfy anyone else, but to satisfy myself is like, I kept saying, well, I want to go there. And I challenged myself to go there. Um, and I, and I carried that to almost every aspect of my life. And, um, 
it has served me well over time. I've had to go back and put it in check sometimes because you can go overboard with that. But it always has been the thing that's propelled me forward. And, and was Cliff, I, sorry, Ian, just one point. Cliff, I, one of my memories of graduation, I have a few, business school graduation, was seeing you with your brothers. Uh, it was such an impressive uh, presentation. I think there were two of them with you. Is that right? Probably there were two. I have three younger ones, as I said, but uh, it might have been two there. Yeah. But just the, the barber excellence was, was clear. The way you walked around, the way the three of you carried yourself. That's literally a memory I have from, from graduation. Oh, that's great. Yeah. And, and you know, my brother's, uh, it really stems to my father. And my father was a big presence in our lives. And he was big on education. His, his big, you know, in his family. Um, and uh, his example was to us as boys, you know, we looked up to our father and, and people used to tell us in the neighborhood, it's like, we'd see you and we'd see your father. And then there's like the four of you, like stair step, we were two years apart and they'd always cut see us if we were on the bicycles going together, if we were, so everything was, you know, was, was the kids and the father. And, you know, there's, there is something about, um, you know, having that male figure in the house and, and also to the bonding that takes place that is um, invaluable, I think, in terms of development. But you can see so much of my father, uh, of course, both my parents, but certainly as boys, so much of my father in all four of us. And we took little bits of him and, uh, and, then, and then took those further. And he always wanted more for us than what he had achieved, although he had achieved a lot in his life. He was the first person uh, in his generation, he's the first person to go to college. His mother only had a high school wow. education and his father had a, only an eighth grade education. Uh, and yet they put all four of their children through college. And then, you know, just thinking of that legacy, it always just, it puts an extra you step back and say, wow, you know, to, for them to make the sacrifices they made. And then for me to get where I want, but always wanting more for the next generation. And my father did want that for the next generation more, but you saw that in the four of us. Wow. So it sounds like your family obviously was a huge, uh, played a huge role. At what point in your life did, it sounds like a faith commitment also was, was really important. Was that something that you developed early or uh, acquired later on in life? So yeah, it was very, right from the very beginning. My parents, interestingly, my parents are uh, of, of mixed faith. So my father is Catholic and my mother is a uh, Baptist. Um, and it's very interesting because uh, she's a very Baptist family. So, and her father was like one of those always there on a Sunday, one of the one of the stalwarts in the church. And so, when my mother came and said, uh, to announced that she had met this Catholic boy in Chicago, he was beside himself. He's like, "You mean uh, this big old city full of black men? You can't find one, one uh, Baptist or Protestant. You got to go all the way to Catholic. What's wrong with you?" So, um, but they, you know, against all odds, they got married and. Uh, we we're Catholic, but my mother really wanted to make sure that we had both. So we actually felt hard done by. So many of you who are sick of church or whatever, I had to go to two. So I don't want to hear anybody's story about I don't want to go to church, but um, I had to go to the Catholic, which was like one hour quick, you know, get it done, get your homily, whatever. And then the Baptist was all day because it's like you go in the morning for Sunday school, then you have Vespers and then you have chicken in the evening. It was just like all this whole day of things. So I actually tell people I'm Catholic today. Just because it's like, oh, please, it's just it's one hour on a Sunday. Yeah, I'll take it. <laughs> up. Hey, you're trying to make up for <laughs> But but, you know, uh, more seriously, my my uh, I, I do. I do now appreciate the dual uh, faith bring upbringing because my Catholic faith has taught me a lot. But also I learned the Bible uh, from my mother's faith. She sat I sat at her knee and she taught me and she helped me memorize scriptures and read the Bible and um and so I took something from both. So I feel like I got the best of both worlds in faith, which is for me today. Uh, and faith is really at the center of who I am. So, uh, yeah, faith is, is big. It was really there right from the beginning. It goes back all through the generations. My grandmother uh, coming from New Orleans and the whole New Orleans uh, Catholic community down there, she brought that up with her. And my grandmother down in the Baptist from Mississippi brought that up. And so they combined and so uh, I'm just so uh, grateful, really, to my family heritage to bring all that faith to me, because that's what's that's what's you know helped our our, our uh, black people over the years to persevere some really really cruel situations, as as we all know. Well, 
Nike, I know you wanted to uh, ask the next question. Well, I, you know, in terms of, uh, I want to stay on faith, actually. I, I've never heard an articulation of Baptists and Catholic being uh, kind of dual faiths and dual benefits and the unique benefits that a person gets from both. So that that's very powerful. You know, you shared with us just prior to starting this conversation, Cliff, that you've been doing uh, ministry in the Cook County jail system, which I think you described as the largest jail system in America. Tell us, tell us why you started doing that, and, and tell us, tell us what what you've taken from that. What, what's that experience like, and, and interacting with those, I'm guessing mostly brothers behind bars. Well, let me step back a little bit and tell you. Uh, you know, it, this gets into some other, hopefully, that we'll be able to talk a little bit about. But, you know, uh, looking at the at the country and where we are as black people, um, I, I noticed for, for myself as a trained economist and, and learning in business, I came back and everyone would, would realize across this country and certainly in our big cities, what I would call an economic poverty that afflicts our, our, our people uh, in some pretty profound ways. Uh, across this country and really across the world. Um, and, and when I came here, I actually thought, well, great, I've got all this education and I've learned a lot about economics and business and, and we know there's a wealth problem in our neighborhoods. Let me just figure that out. Maybe it's, you know, if we can just get more people, more jobs. And the more I looked into it, the more I did some work around this, the more I kept looking at recidivism rates where you get jobs and people don't keep the jobs and, 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 we're, and we're not able to get any traction with wealth. I kept scratching my head to say, well, what's the problem here? There's just something, there's, there's something else missing. It's not just economic poverty. And uh, I started to realize that if you look at the whole set of problems that, that are uh, part of, uh, you know, the, the situations that we face uh, in our neighborhoods and our communities, uh, is there's also a spiritual poverty. And, and when you combine the spiritual poverty with the economic poverty, they actually kind of combine to become sometimes a, a, a vicious cycle downward. And, and even if you, uh, we'll, we'll talk about this more, but if you look at the history of our people and how we came to this country, it was faith that really helped us uh, get, a, get a push off at the, at the very beginning, even against the odds. Um, my own grandfather, uh, he came up here with, he would, he would often tell me I didn't have a, a, a pot to piss in when I came up here from Mississippi, but he sent all three of his kids to college and he had bought a house in the suburbs. He always had a Cadillac was his thing coming from the <laughs> top. But, um, you know, he did that because he had deep faith. You know, he, I, I remember my grandfather now, he would, I'd go over and, and every day he, all he ever did, he worked as a, um, he pressed shirts cleaners and he worked on one side of chicago and he'd have to drive uh almost two hours every morning across the city of chicago he got up at like three in the morning drove for two hours across the city just to press shirts and there was no air conditioning he's hot the whole time and then he would come back two hours at the other end of the day and um and 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 you know he made kind of like a minimum wage in a way but they, they lived a very simple life. He came back and uh, I remember he'd always sit back and he'd put his slippers on and, and he'd have someone bring his, say, bring me the Bible. And he'd sit there and he'd read the Psalms. He'd read five Psalms every, every evening. And sometimes he'd read them out loud to me. And, um, but it was his faith. It was his faith that really allowed it. And, and just kind of what I would call those kind of gospel truths about living simply, living for God, all the rest that allowed him to, lift his family out of, you know, from nothing uh, to create my mother, who then brought me and, and now my own children. And that that's the story of our people, really, is that kind of perseverance um, and, you, and the spiritual. Do you, thing. Same, do you so, think that same sentiment that your grandfather expressed, does that exist today, do you think, in the vast majority of our community? And if, and it, and if, and if not, how do we resurrect that? So, you know, again, I don't have the statistics, Ian, to answer it specifically anecdotally from what I see. And I do a lot, I try to spend a lot of time traversing through neighborhoods, speaking to people uh, who are not in my circles, uh, you know, in terms of my business world and so forth. And I don't see it as much, uh, particularly amongst the young people. And, I've, we, you know, the statistics do show this, both for the broader community as well as for our own black uh, community, 
there has been a falling away from faith, particularly amongst the younger generation, millennials and below. And that is devastating for the whole society, my personal opinion. It's really devastating for us because the problem is we're facing some of the same odds, if not worse odds than we were decades ago, but we don't have the same armor and tool sets to fight it. So it actually really uh, disappoints me. Uh, as you ask how we get it back, um, it, it's tough because some of the things that, that have happened, when, when you start to, when we've started to move away from faith, what comes in are some other ills that we can see in terms of uh, all the ills that you would all know about, the social ills that have entered our communities. And those are really hard. They, they were relatively easy to come in. They're relatively difficult to, to, to uproot. Um, so I'm not sure what the quick solution is, but um, I think, you know, helping people develop a, both, which is what I started out with this long answer to your question, Nike, that a little bit of trying to help the economic, but at the same time, the spiritual is the only durable way to move it forward. And when I'm in the jails, I, I do the jail ministry once a week and where I go into the cells. I work in Division six of of the Cook County Jail. Uh, these are sort of people with uh, not the not the highest crimes, kind of middle crimes. So it'd be things like, uh, you know, drug possession, drug selling, uh, rape. Um, but I'm in there with those guys uh, once a week. And, you know, there, there's a yearning there for this. You can tell that they would recognize that something's missing and they don't know what's missing. They've hit bottom. And so they want it, but they don't but they're not getting it. So the good news is when I'm in there, th there are many of, of uh, as, as you said, like you, it is many uh, black and brown people that I interact with, uh, not not exclusively, but mostly. And so what I, what I do see is a hunger for this. And then that is, to me, a very positive thing. I have some really positive conversations with uh, young men uh, uh, in, in those cells that are life-giving to me, and I know life-giving to them. And I have seen a trajectory where it moves them onto a more positive footing. But it has to be the economic and the spiritual, in my estimation, given where we are. Wow. Well, you know, Ian, I feel like we need to have this. We're not done, but I think we need Cliff back for a part two, because I'm not sure we're even going to get to his 18 years in London, his economic development work, and all of that is exceptionally important because it all connects. But, you know, Cliff, we have, we have something we call the speed round, uh, where we, we uh, you know, posit uh, two set of individuals or two, two uh, philosophies and ask you to sort of pick uh, an individual in philosophy and kind of ex explain why. So we'll, we'll start with the easy one, which is Malcolm or Martin. And you can't go, it's a little bit of both. That's not fair, right? You can't answer like that, right? Correct. Please. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm going to pick Malcolm and, uh, and I'm going to say that resolutely because first of all, when I was uh, in business school, actually with you guys, I spent a whole summer just reading everything about Malcolm X. I was, I really, I wanted to know everything because I was very much on, on the path of, of um, self-help and economic development. It was huge on my mind. So I read everything about it. The reason I say it with, with such resolution is because of where we are today. And I'm, I'm speaking about today. And I see that our political system, uh, and we always, you know, hope springs eternal, that it will get better. But uh, there's a lot of gridlock there. And uh, I don't see that we've been able to make much progress, at least for black people uh, on the political realm. For, for me, it's been decades. I, I think it's just been really stalled. And I mean, there've been little things here and there, but, but something you know, that really moves the, the needle, uh, you know, it hasn't been there. And I really do feel like, uh, here's the other thing, you know, we are 14% of the population roughly, I don't know, 50 million people are black people. If you look at where we're headed, we are going to be a more black and brown country, but mostly more brown country. Actually, uh, we are we are less and less. We do punch above our weight uh, because of his history. But increasingly, we, it's it, tussling for attention in this country is going to be hard. So I'm, I'm a little I'm not sure we're going to get all the bang under, for the buck for the for the for the, uh, the MLK. So that's why I'm going to the uh, to the Malcolm. I think a lot of it is going to have to come with us thinking ourselves about how we start an engine of, of, of economic growth. 
It has to be the spiritual and economic, but it's going to have to be more incumbent upon us and us supporting one another to get that done. It is possible. And I think now is the time for that. Brilliant. Well, I'm going to skip um, civil rights or economic development because I think you just answered that. But we'll go to our last one, which is entrepreneurship or corporate leadership. Yeah, you know, I, I, I do think it's uh, it's going to I think it's more entrepreneurialism now. Again, if I have to take one or the other, uh, I, I spoke to you earlier about uh, as a result of I'm here because of civil rights. So all the work that uh, Martin Luther King and Malcolm X did, but certainly all of the new legislation that came into place in the 1960s. I am here because of that. Um, me, I mean, as a corporate person. So I went to business school. I, I kind of moved up the corporate ladder and, and, and had all those sorts of corporate jobs, so to speak. Um, and that has benefited some of us, a small percentage of us. But the lion's share of us have not benefited. And I don't think the lion's share are going to benefit by going through the system the way I did. I just don't think it, it produces enough benefit for the whole and I'm concerned about that. So I do think it has to be, it's kind of in line with what I just said. It is going to have to be more people uh, staking out on their own. But then when they stake out on their own, looking back and helping others, that is going to be the way that, that we'll get lift off. Brilliant. Thank you, Cliff. Yeah. So Cliff, I, yeah, I know you've done a lot of work around the issue of intergenerational wealth. Uh, and the lack of the transfer of intergenerational wealth within the black community. We often talk about the racial wealth gap, and I know you just talked about entrepreneurship. You've dedicated a lot of your expertise to this idea of how do you create more entrepreneurship, more money, more transfer? What are some of the principles that have been driving you to get more blacks, people in the community to realize that entrepreneurship may be the pathway towards how I build wealth. What are the, some of the strategies and organizations, the CFDIs that you've been working with? Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's, you could, you could look and see there's, uh, here's one statistic that floored me when I got back from the UK, which was that uh, using the uh, SBA loans as a proxy for how much capital is going into black communities. Um, of, of all of that, uh, only 2% of the SBA cap, or SBA, excuse me, SBA loans, that went into small businesses, went to black owned businesses, only 2%. Wow. That's just, you know, you, you're not going to get, and we all know that really small businesses are the engine of growth of the country and, um, and, and, and creation and, of and jobs. And outside of the 2%, where is the rest of the money going? Was it predominantly? So the majority of course is to white owned businesses. Uh, Asian would be the next. And then Hispanic, uh, I think was around uh, 5%. And then black is 2%. Almost Almost, I mean, the margin of error for the statistics almost means it, it's almost indiscernible from zero. Right. And, I'm and you know, we all know as people uh, in business, you know, the, the flow of capital is really the lifeblood of how businesses can yeah. flourish. Yeah. If you not get if the lifeblood is cut off, they can't grow. They can't get started and they can't grow. So we ha I knew there was a problem when I saw that. And, and the problem is, is it the supply of people who want to do business or is it the, is it the, uh, is, our, is it the demand for the capital or is it the supply of the capital? And we as a group quickly came up that it really is at the start, <clears throat> the supply of capital. So that's where I've done a lot of my work over the last uh, couple of years is we have a lot of really smart uh, black entrepreneurs who have some great business ideas, but they can't get capital. And if they can't get capital, sometimes the business dies, great ideas, or it can't grow. So we, we've got to solve that problem first. Uh, we do have a lot of, I mean, it's not, we can always have more people who have great business ideas and we can work on that. Right now, the big problem is we have, we have a problem with uh, trust. Uh, you know, big banks don't want to make loans. It's, it's kind of like implicit redlining it again, all over again, which is, oh, you know, you, you come from a risky neighborhood, we're not going to give you capital. Or, well, we're not sure about Black-owned businesses because most of them seem to fail or something like that. We still have that going on. Uh, it's just not up and it's not like as explicit as drawing a red line around a neighborhood. And so that is the problem is right now for me, it's how do we get more capital to some really bright, young uh, Black entrepreneurs that are, that are scattered all across this country. Got it. 
And so, and maybe that's a great segue into our 16-year-old uh, Daryl, who great black kid who lives in forgotten USA. <clears throat> and he's seeing that, you know, maybe in his town, he's not seeing uh, everything that you just described in terms of what could be possible. And so he's not, he, there isn't anyone in his world that's telling him about entrepreneurship or the fact that there is capital out there and there are ways to access it. What would you tell Daryl about his prospects in life and what he has the ability to, to, to control and influence in his own life? Yeah. One thing I would tell Daryl to start with is, you know, all of us, every single one of us was created in the image and likeness of God. That's an amazing thing to realize. Every single one of us was created in the image and likeness of God. That means anything is possible for you. I mean, but the problem is lots of things in your head, Daryl, uh, are going to tell you that it's not. People in your neighborhood, people in your own family are all going to tell you nothing's possible. And fighting off those voices is the hardest thing. So you have to, first of all, convince yourself that everything is possible. Uh, and once you can do that and you're dealing with those with those voices up there, I would the number one thing I would say is, you know, keep aiming high and surround yourself with people who are not like yourself or who you want to be. Because the, you, you start to surround yourself with people who are like, oh, I, maybe I don't belong in that group. Well, you can belong in any group you want to belong in. Go find the people that you want to be like and aim high and then get around them. Make sure you're the ones who are the, 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 the other ones who are kind of below you or whatever, or you feel like are, are not a good influence, keep them over here, but look out there and aim for the ones who you want to be part of and get them around. You go to them and be around them or make sure you get around them. What you'll find is they'll, they will, uh, uh, they'll rub off on you and you'll become more like them. And then they'll be below you and you'll get another group. And that was the story I told of myself was I identified those people downstate when I was at the science fair and said, that's the group I want to be with. And that's a really important thing. Who you surround yourself is, is who you'll become like. Wow. And uh, maybe I'll just add one more question, which is that, as you know, we're at a very, we're having a national reckoning, a national conversation about race where someone might've heard what you just said to Daryl and they say, yeah, but, you know, there's structural barriers that make it impossible for Daryl to do the kinds of things that you just said. Like, what, what would you say to that kind of response? That it's just, it's too overwhelming. It's too systemic. So, you know, I would, I would give you the, uh, I, I, will, I do go back to our ancestors. Um, my uh, cousin, Deborah Martin Chase, she's the executive uh, producer of the movie Harriet, which um, hopefully all of you have seen or, or, or will see. But it, it, it really, uh, for me, one of the things that just struck me when I watched it was the perseverance of this woman mm -hmm. and her faith. And all the odds were against her. I mean, there was all sorts of structural stuff in her way. I mean, really big structural stuff in her <laughs> way. And, and she was able to, you know, buy whatever she was able to get by it. And if she got through it, so can you. And so can I. And I think that is, I think what you have to keep in your mind is um, there, there have been those who have gone before you who have gone through some unbelievable um, uh, uh, roadblocks and keep that in mind. Even when people are, even when you see the roadblocks or even when you feel them or people are telling you about them, you have to believe it's the mental thing of I can get through this, but it's also faith. If you look at Harriet Tubman, it was her faith. And, you know, she just really stood on her faith to knock through the barriers that were there. And she just did, she was stubborn as well. She didn't believe what people told her. If people told her it wasn't possible, she didn't believe it. She said it is possible and she moved through it. So that is a, a stubbornness, a determination, which is in our blood from, we know that because we've seen it in our history and it's to bring that back up in a different context. Of course, Daryl's in a urban city with structural racism Harriet Tubman was a different kind of an impediment, but she had that steeliness, which got her through, is to call on that same stubbornness and determination. Wow, Cliff, thank you very much. You stood on faith to knock through barriers. It's really powerful. Cliff, man, it's so good to see you. Yeah, it is great. <laughs> we could be here forever. It's just uh, great to talk with you guys. And I learned so much from you guys. And I appreciate your questions and also having me here. It's just such a great blessing. No, I, I think we'll I think we need to have a few conversations. Just really inspired by everything you're doing, man. Really 
really wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you guys for what you're doing and for having me again. Yeah. You and Cliff, importantly, my, my entire family saw Harriet uh, on opening opening night and uh, really enjoyed the film immensely. We might even have to now watch it again on some streaming service since you, you've mentioned it. But uh, yeah, always a pleasure, my brother. Uh, you know, and it's funny, right? We haven't talked probably in what, 12 years, but it's, oh, it's just least, like yeah. yesterday. It is. <laughs> it is like yesterday. We need to have a Zoom call with all the, uh, the original members of the Invisible Men. I Absolutely. Think, yeah, that think, would be a lot of fun. I'm yeah. not sure that would, we'd, have, we'd have to have a lot of Zoom time for that one, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you everyone for watching the latest episode of The Invisible Men. If you'd like to see any, any episode of uh, the series, please go to www.invisible.com dot men and we're so inspired to have guests like cliff barber on cliff thank you for joining us and thank you everyone thank you for watching another episode of the invisible men you can find other episodes at the aei podcast channel on youtube or the website invisible.men or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts 